Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Zoom talk this week with Kara Chan. Kara Chan's a sculptor who lives and works in Los Angeles. And she got her MFA from UCLA in 2017 and her BFA from NYU in 2009. And she's done a bunch of residencies at Oxbow and Vermont, Studio Center, Banff, uh, the Salzburg Summer Academy. And she's had recent exhibitions at Ochi Projects and Dab Oak. And first of all, we're going to start with asking you how your quarantine life has been. <laughs> um, I, it's been pretty okay. I'm quarantining up in Topanga Canyon right now, which is actually pretty nice. I said earlier that I've just been pretty much doing the same two mile loop three times a day and picking a lot of wildflowers <laughs> and I'm doing dishes for another six hours a day. <laughs> so I'm working from home, which is pretty nice. Um, and I moved my studio from downtown LA into the garage. So I'm still able to work on a couple of things up here. So it's, it's going. Um, and what's like, uh, what's the feel like in Topanga Canyon? You were just, we were talking a little bit casually about it, but I feel like in New York, um, people are like venturing outside a little bit more, but everyone still, like the whole city still feels pretty traumatized, <laughs> um, you know? So what's, what's it like out yonder? It's pretty nerve wracking for me to leave the house still. Um, I think last weekend we drove to this farm stand in Malibu and we're on the PCH and there's kind of like hundreds of people out just going to the beaches with no masks on. <laughs> so I get really, really nervous and upset. So I just try really not to leave this little two mile loop that I'm in. But otherwise in Topanga, it's pretty nice. There's a lot of space. Um, and I actually really haven't been into LA proper in a really long time. So I don't know what life is like in the main city. <laughs> um, so Gabby, do you want to pull up some of uh, Kara's image, images of Kara's work? Yeah, of course. I think we were going to start out um, just sort of as a basic opening question. Um, we wanted to ask you about um, the relationship of your work to icons and relief sculpture. Um, your work, which I'm going to pull up now, has really strong references to um, the history of ancient friezes and vases. Um, and that's not a, oops, it's not what we're doing. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, and um, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about um, this uh, body of work of relief sculptures and um, how you came to this format and what you're interested in talking about both art historically and in terms of contemporary friezes and figuration. Yeah, so when I think of the term icon, a really specific style of portraiture comes to mind. And it's usually the representation of one or a few subjects and usually within a religious context. So the figures are static and usually, I guess, in front of a minimal flat background. And there's a sense of inverse perspective. So instead of lines converging inward onto a point on the horizon, the perspective converges onto the viewer. So reliefs tend to lend themselves to this style. 
Um, so in my reliefs, the main focus is on a single figure or a few figures that protrude into space. Um, the series was the first time that I've worked in this 2D, 3D realm. It's the first time that I did something that was wall mounted. Before I was really only doing sculptures or videos involving sculptures that I made. So I think the piece that relates most closely to classical relief sculpture and reference is the River Dippers, which is this one. Um, and this is referential of the famous Three Graces. And I really like this piece because it's pretty dynamic because you get a view of the right side body, the left side body, and the back side. Um, so you kind of get a 360 degree view of the body. Uh, when I think of the Greek vases, I think of narrative scenes that display like static and crisp outline figured with the capacity for action. So there's like these different poses and gestures that are expressive in depicting scenes from everyday life as well as heroic and um, mythological themes. So there's a sense of narrative implied action in my reliefs as well. And I think this comes from references that I use. So usually in sourcing the images that I create these reliefs from, I found this treasure trove of videos that this um, collective put out and it was called The Naked Club. And there are these nudists who film themselves just having fun. So <laughs> they're at the beach or a volleyball tournament or a Halloween party or gardening. And I'll watch these videos through and whenever I see like a really interesting um, composition, I'll like freeze the frame and like hone in on the specific scene that yeah. I <laughs> Kara, um, this nudist club, uh, yeah. you have to pay to access the videos, right? Yeah, you do. And so what are the videos from now? Are they currently being shot all the time? Yeah, they're currently being shot. It's a pretty active club and anybody can join if you want to uh, go on an adventure with them. So, is there dialogue too or just movements? There's mostly just movements. They have a lot of transition. So it's like transition over transition of over transition of all of these different scenes. So it's kind of super like fast paced. Mm. Just there's, it's usually like a music in the background that's carrying this narrative. Okay, so they're not like playing out scenes or anything, I guess. No, it's okay. All <laughs> live action <laughs> and it's like really is it really banal like they're just doing stuff it kind of is but then there's like people playing with devil sticks and like twirling hula hoops and stuff <laughs> like that so <laughs> it's really it's not that banal okay <laughs> <laughs> Um, how did you start making, like, what was it that first drew you to this kind of imagery? It came from when I actually went to the gem show. It was the first gem show that I went to as an adult. And I, I went there with my friend, Brandy, who's a really amazing jewelry maker. Um, and we were in Tucson, um, and basically the entire city shuts down. So hotel rooms and like parking lots and stadiums just become kind of a place where people from all around the world can converge and sell these gems. And the only item that I picked up was this lapis lazuli carved penis. I think I have some slides of flats of these things. Let's see. These are just from the gem show. 
Yeah, so as you can see, like, there's stalactites, fossils. These are ones kind of, this is a shot from my studio of like different types of stones that could be representative of genitalia. So, and these are breasts, my collection of breasts. So this lapis lazuli penis kind of like tickled my brain in a certain way. Um, is and it this one? Yeah, yeah, these guys. Okay. Yeah. So I purchased one and we, I was like driving back to Los Angeles and all of a sudden like this entire series kind of just materialized. So we actually had to drive back to Tucson so I can begin collecting more pieces to uh, embed within these reliefs. Um. Um, why did it tickle your brain, Kara? What was the tickle? I want to know. <laughs> um, I guess I don't, it was just like a really, I picked it up as like a kind of like a gag gift. And I was like, oh, I'll get this as a gift for somebody. And then I realized that the gift was for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I've always, I guess really been interested in the human form and like I ever since I can remember all of my sculptures have always like incorporated figuration. So when I was at the gem show I kind of became more discerning when it came to collecting these parts. There's oh. a slide in there. So, um, I have like stories about all of these slides, kind of. Well, this is a special stone, right? Wainsite. So I was like thinking about like really inspirational things. Like going to the gem show is really inspirational. And at the same time, it's like really can be really sad. But this is like a more inspirational moment. So maybe I'll talk about the sad part first. Um, so like year after year, I've been going, I think I've gone for the past three years and year after year, you can follow these trends where there are certain types of crystals that will be really popular. So the first year that I went, the gem that I saw all over the place was this one called Apophyllite, which I incorporated in one of my pieces. It's like kind of like a window shape and it has, yeah. So these actually, these were four flats of apophyllite that I bought the first time I had gone. And the next year at the gem show, there were like very many fewer vendors selling this gem. And then the third year that I went, there was just like a handful. So um, this is when I began to realize that like this mine had been like completely mined to depletion and there were like barely any of these types of crystals left. So that's when I kind of became more discerning about choosing really special specific gems and not going crazy when I go to these places. So I think slide 17, that was a really fun one that also tickled my brain in the same way that the carved Carol, can you talk a little bit about the, like, so the phallus in art history, you mm -hmm. know, we see so many representations of it, but not so many of the vulva. Mm -hmm. And um, can you talk a little bit about your research into the representations of, I don't know, vaginas? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess I began carving penises and vaginas from stone with the idea in mind that these stone carved pieces that I were, was making would become part of the relief series. And immediately this evolved into its own body of work where the carvings became sculptures in their own right. So last summer I attended a stone carving residency in Austria that was at the foot of the Untersberg mountain. And before I traveled there, 
I stopped in Vienna and went to their natural history museum there where I went to visit the Venus of Willendorf. And there's a photo in the slideshow, that one right there, yeah. So these were like the Venus of Willendorf, she has her own room in the museum that's dedicated to her. And then outside there was this small display of these two items, which were titled Venus II and Venus III. Um, and these were found right beside her. And Venus II was almost a complete object. And Venus III was a complete piece with an unclear meaning. So I stared at these two objects for a really long time. And I noticed that Venus II looked like a finger and Venus III kind of looked like a Hitachi magic wand. So it kind of began to make sense why these two items would be buried right next to this fertility figure. So when I got back to Los Angeles, then I started kind of really delving into researching uh, ancient stone carved genitalia. Um, and this brought me to the Shilinigig, which um, I think was like a big treasure trove for me in terms of finding references where vaginas were depicted. So these um, are these figurative carvings of naked women who are pulling open their vaginas and displaying these really exaggerated vulvas. And they date back to the 12th century and are found in churches all over Northern Spain, France, Ireland, and Scotland. And there's a couple theories about these figures. Uh, one is that they come from an ancient pre-Christian or pagan uh, fertility religion that was followed by agricultural folk and country districts. And they hold within them this apotropaic power um, that's associated with um, like that of the evil eye. So there was this story where women would pull up their skirts to expose their genitalia and that would kind of scare off enemies and evil. Um, so there's kind of like these, this protective quality in them. And then another theory is that they um, were kind of, they've just like supported the church's moral teachings um, to reflect subjects that uh, were of like doom and judgment. Uh, and it was like the medieval church's campaign against morality. So those are those guys. I love this one. I actually made a carving that kind of incorporated that, that region down there. But there was another story that I really liked that like in tandem with this story about this uh, professor who was surveying ruined churches after World War II. And when he looked inside the altar in one of these churches that was totally decimated by a bomb, he found a male organ that was, it was like a stone carved male organ. And this led him down the path to visit other churches. And he found that in 90% of the churches up to the time of the Black Plague, there were penises that were um, put inside of the altars. And I think that reckons back to this, um, this like apotropaic theory of the evil eye and kind of, um, I, I like to think that like I'm carving these penises and vaginas as also like a tribute to this folkloric magic. And it's like, I think at the entrance of our door, I have like a couple stone carved penises out there as a way to protect the house. <laughs> I guess that leads to another question of what it's like to sculpt a vagina out of stone. <laughs> or how do you deal with extreme material translations that occur in the work? 
Yeah, it's actually pretty difficult, I think, to carve a vagina out of stone. Is that uh, you? Hmm? Oh, okay. okay. Sorry about that. There was like some wind happening. Uh, okay. Continue, Kara. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I first Kara started carving the penis out of stone because I think it's like a really simple sculptural shape. Um, and when it came to the vagina, this is why I started doing like the research into the ancient stove stone carved pieces, just because I kind of was looking for a reference point on like where to even begin. So when I'm carving, I actually like to even look through like Georgia O'Keeffe paintings as a source of inspiration. But so like, I'll choose a stone and the stone, like the size of the stone and the shape of the stone will dictate how I basically start. And then like I'm carving and I'm carving and all of a sudden like I'll hit a crack in perfectly the wrong spot and an entire like section will just like fall off. Or you have to follow cracks to like take out the weaker sections. Um, so it's kind of like a collaboration that I'm doing with the stone itself. And there's this, I found like this softness and this malleability where with the vaginas in particular in carving them, I chose to leave part of the original stone exposed or create texture based on the tools that I'm using um, instead of just like bringing the stone to a complete polish. So this allows for like differentiation and texture and it gives the notion of um, different feelings of hardness and softness. Um, I was actually gonna, I think this is a good um, place to sort of talk about a little bit about um, the sort of like the theme of this conversation, which is pareidolia. Um, I don't know, actually, if I'm saying that correctly, but um, the way that you, I mean, obviously, the, the work is carved, and you're also incorporating found, um, found crystals or rocks. Mm -hmm. um, but like a lot of the way that you introduce new materials is to both reinforce and obscure like um areas of your work that are like really loaded right either the face or the genitals in ways that both kind of like replicate those areas and yeah. also um like negate them and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process um like I think you were talking a little bit earlier about how you choose those rocks um, or gems, like how you decide that something is like a face rock versus a vagina rock or something like this. Yeah. And then on the other hand, like what's, what's up with um, this process of obscuring and revealing um, that you're engaged in? Yeah. So with the relief series, this was the first time I combined the stone and the figure. And the crystals became this device to censor the private regions of the figures and also accentuate them and draw attention to them at the same time. So when I'm confronted with like a naked figure in a magazine or on screen or in real life, my eyes will like typically just like hone in on those erogenous zones. Um, but with the pieces, uh, like with the busts, this became a, like a super uh, personal uh, series. And it started when I was on Fisher's Island um, and the majority of the stones I collected were from Isabella Beach. And it's a beach that there's no sand, it's just like all of these stones. And I walked this beach every single day. That's the one and always like just looking down. And I began to notice in particular, there were, I was finding a lot of stones, like a really strange amount of stones that they were perfectly eroded in a way that they looked like nipple-like protrusions coming out of the stone. So I started collecting all of these and, into my studio. 
And as I was walking, I also began noticing um, these stones that were like really large and smooth and about the size of my head. Um, and these also became like these really seductive objects. So I started collecting these too. Um, and about three weeks in, that's when I began my first bust. So the island, it was like a very isolated place and it was, I was there in the dead of winter. Um, so I think there was like 90 or like 200 year round inhabitants on the island. So it was just like really quiet. And right before I went to the island, um, I kind of experienced this, uh, this fallout with uh, my best friend at the time. So I turned away from carving these headless figures that were in the relief to um, carving portraits, which seemed to provide a sense of solace. So the first bust that I carved, this was before the busts, when I was still into genitals. <laughs> but the first bust I carved, that's with my friend Julia. Um, and she's always the person who I call when it comes to having like concerns about interpersonal matters. So it provided this sense of um, solace to kind of carve a familiar friend. So it was this sensation of like needing a familiar friend compounded with the sensation of loss that began this whole series. And then when I moved to California, I, or like when I moved back to California from this residency, I started doing a portrait of my parents. Um, and there they are. So I used this uh, portrait in particular. This was their wedding portrait and this kind of like a Sears portrait and I really loved the way that like their bodies were posed as if they were sculptures. Um, so that's them but um, I titled these busts with the first names of the people who I base them on. So this is really the only indication where their identity is revealed. Um, as objects, there are these faceless humans that invite the viewer to project their own sense of personhood onto the subject. And like for as long as I can remember, even as a kid, whenever I drew uh, people or figures or faces, none of them had faces. They were always like kind of just this blank there was always like a blank space where the faces would be. So to me, I think this idea of identity has always felt really abstract. Um, and it, I think it kind of comes from really the sense of like, I have this vivid, a bunch of these vivid memories of taking these standardized tests and when it comes to like filling out, like checking the boxes and filling out like questions about my ethnicity, I never knew what box to check. So there was one that was other. So I would just like always check that box because at the time, like you couldn't check multiple boxes. Um, so, and I never like came, I didn't come from a family that was steeped in cultural tradition or like shared stories about ancestors or heritage and like my last name is Chan but my dad identifies as Filipino that's what he was born he grew up there and he uh, came to the United States in his 20s and then my mom is like a mix of three or four or five different types of Caucasian so I usually just say that she's from New Jersey uh, <laughs> Because that's where she was born and grew up and still resides. Um, and then, like, this extends further where, like, on a recent application, I started, like, agonizing over which box to check when it asked, um, it was, like, for the LGBTQ. 
And then I became really confused because like my partner identifies as gender non-binary. So I didn't know how I should identify. And then it comes to like taxes <laughs> where I have like, I don't know what occupation I should be like putting myself into. It kind of always like made me feel weird to identify as an artist. And I usually, when I'm asked this question, I usually say like I'm a sculptor. So it's like all of these, all of these like questions around my identity and like this feeling of I guess like being other made this really, really confusing for me. So this is why I think that the faces in my sculpture are obscured and the rocks become symbolic of this confusion and this heaviness and this otherness. Um, and they're like really specific and really ubiquitous at the same time. And last year I had a show um, where I displayed some of these busts and this show was called A Part of Things. And I think this references the feeling <laughs> deep down where I like crave to like kind of know, well, like I wanna be a part of things, but I don't even know what that means or where, that, where I lie in that. Um, Kara, can you talk a little bit about um your aesthetics and its relationship to display, especially museum display, because I feel like in a lot of, a, of your work, you reference um, like the fragment and how it's displayed and insert things into cases. Yeah. So uh, I feel like the purpose of like fragmenting the forms is to refine the focus on the parts that demand the action and to expose certain strengths and vulnerabilities there. Um, so the series that I like to, this is um, that I like to like talk about in reference to this was the one that starts with the pinky Finger. prompt. Got it. Yeah. We'll start here for just a minute and okay. then we will. <laughs> Scroll through the penises. <laughs> the hot dog vagina. <laughs> oh, so there's like some of the insert kind of those yeah. are like from museum. Where is that? Where is that museum? Those are from museums, yeah. So I remember, I think this was at this was at the archaeological museum in Istanbul. Um, and I really became pretty obsessed with this particular type of display. And it contained these tiny sculptures and figurines. And these are from Southern Mesopotamia, circa 1500 BC. And there's one slide, maybe, is it the next slide? Yeah, that one. I was putting this PowerPoint together and then I noticed, I didn't even realize until I revisited this, that there's like, these guys are like fornicating. <laughs> but anyway, I became interested in like this thick foam that was used in the display. And like the holes were cut like perfectly to the shape of the sculpture, um, almost like hugging them or cradling them. So that's where I, like I made this pinky promise out of ceramic and then I think it was just like kicking around my studio for about a year before I finally decided to kind of encase it within this museum display. And I really like, I guess right before I went into quarantine, the, yeah, I started revisiting this series and making all of these clay gestures um, and they're going to also be displayed in a similar manner. So this is in your studio and you don't have access to this. And what have you been doing in your new studio, <laughs> your temporary studio? <laughs> in my new temporary studio, I have been working on this, pro this fruit project. Um, 
I've been actually working on a lot of different things, but I've been working on this fruit project like most immediately now. Um, so I started before the quarantine happened, I started visiting farmers markets on a weekly basis and collecting fruits in the same way that I started collecting the gems. So anything that was in the shape of a penis or a vagina, a sphincter or breasts, I would kind of pick up and go home and immediately cast them. Um, and um, they're in going to turn out to be, I'm like making a fruit bowl where I can kind of arrange all of these fruits in there. And wait, can you talk a little bit about that uh, figure of the man holding the peach? Yeah. So this is when I started, like, I guess, like, the correlation between, like, fruit and genitalia has, is, like, as old as, as old as time, as old as history. <laughs> <laughs> so these are these, um, figures that are holding peaches because, like, very much, like, in emoji culture, the peach is representative of vagina, a vagina, and the same is with like pomegranates, especially ones that are like slightly cracked open where the seeds are exposed. And then there's another slide in here that has like the fingered citron. Yeah, so that's, that's like a beautifully, I think it's jade, a jade carved lemon with fingers. And that was also um, supposed to represent a vagina. And wait, what was jade? You, you told me this, but I forgot. <laughs> jade is like represents something crazy. Yeah, <laughs> jade. Um, gosh, I think I was reading about these, these figurines and jade is celestial dragon ejaculate. <laughs> so that's, that was, that's the correlation to jade <laughs> or a theory of how jade um, made its way into the world. I feel like there's a really strong, like hearing you talk about um, all of this now, it feels like there's a strong correlation between um, like a gesture that would want to like reinforce something by obscuring it um and a gesture that would want like and and the impulse to like um describe a gesture and also freeze it in place at the same time you know like there's this relationship between um like between trying to underscore and trying to contain in your work that i feel like is a really interesting tension mm -hmm. um and i was wondering like how like how you think about um, stone carving as part of this like endeavor because it's so hard you know it's like not a fluid thing to do at all right like you literally have to like, <laughs> um like you you have to you're engaging in this practice with it which is not only like millennia old like millennia of years old but it's also something which requires like a certain amount of like certitude and effort like you have to know something about what you want and where you're going um like when you start out it's you know it's not like it's not like making a painting where you're just like oh whatever <laughs> i mean i do that <laughs> but you know what i mean yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> it's it's I have I think I've had a lot of practice because before stone carving I was carving in foam and that became like the the base where I could then like carve out the main figure and then add on all of these you know put plaster on top of it and like add all of these shapes and make it really how I want to see it but yeah with stone carving it's kind of like you know, you make one mistake or, and then it just turns into something else. Um, so I don't. <laughs> and where do you get, like when you're carving stone, where do you get them from? I, there's a place in California 
um, up in Ventura where I've been getting some of the stone. Um, I think it's uh, Art City Studios. And it's a really cool place because there's a ton of stone carvers who work on the premises. Um, so it's kind of a really nice community up there. And then I got really, I kind of hit the jackpot this year uh, because one of my coworkers moved into a studio and um, the person who was there before him was a stone carver and they, they left literally tons of rocks there and just like went to Philadelphia. So he, <laughs> so he like called me up and was like, hey, do you want to pick up some of these stones? So that's, that's where I have most of my material from. So I have a big boulder collection in the backyard over here. And that's what you're, you're working on now is like a big yeah. Yeah, I, there's a slide of some, something that I'm like kind of working on now where I'm combining uh, the crystals and, and the stone. So that's kind of like a new, new path that I'm interested in going down. Is that that one with the crystal that we looked at before? It's like or really clear. Really clear, yeah, it's a Lemurian quartz. Yeah. And that was the only purchase that I made at the most recent gem show. Um, in the meantime, if y'all have questions, um, please send them to me and we'll ask, uh, we'll ask Kara within this forum at seven-ish. We will uh, like loosen up the conversation and we can kind of have a more casual like, you know, conversation with Kara about um, any number of things, but if you have specific questions now about her work or anything that we've talked about, please send them over and I will ask while I also look for, ah, found it, while I look for this image. So this is the, the crystal, right? Yeah, that's, that's the one. And that's kind of what I'm working on now. It's in a rough, pretty rough state still. I had to put it aside because uh, I don't actually know what the next steps are. <laughs> Do you have to ask someone? Are you, or you no. just don't know like <laughs> in your brain, <laughs> like in your imagination? Yeah, I just gotta, I just gotta get down there. <laughs> How is it possible that you only bought one thing at the gem show? Do you like give yourself these restrictions before I, you go? I don't. I kind of went in blind this year. Like the year before I was like on a mission where I knew uh, that I wanted to make a series of reliefs. So I knew that I had to like, I had like very, an array of like specific things that I was looking for. But this year, I kind of transitioned into stone carving and crystals didn't, weren't really kind of like a big, big thing in my practice anymore. So I was just casually looking around and then this one crystal was kind of kept on calling me back. Um, and and that, that was the one thing that really got my attention this year. Kara, and what are you working on in the fruits? What, where are they gonna be shown? Uh, I, in the new platform of the virtual viewing room at okay. <laughs> OG Projects at the end of June. So okay. I'll, I'll be finishing that piece uh, by that time. And so you're just casting all these fruits. Did you cast the bowl? I well? cast the bowl yesterday. And how did it go? It went um, swimmingly. <laughs> okay, that's good because it, it yeah. could be. It's hard. I was having a lot of anxiety about that one, but yeah. And then, do you still think you're gonna want? Because you were talking about you wanted to work with glass. Yeah, I well, the original idea was to cast these fruits in glass. Uh, I remember my grandma had like a glass fruit bowl and they were like a, just a really popular item I think in like the 60s. There's a whole tradition of like blown glass fruit. So that was like the original um, kind of impulse. But then when quarantine happened, I kind of just yeah. went the plaster route instead. And now I get to paint and I haven't really ever done that. And it's 
kind of fun and also a little frustrating. <laughs> Kara, we have a question from um, Ongo, Caroline, um, about, um, first, it's a two-part question. The first is, um, how do you embed stones into the reliefs, like the Fisher's Island pieces? Mm -hmm. And the second question is about your shirt. Um, if you could, if you could talk to us a little bit about what's happening on your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess before, I guess it was a couple of years ago, I was making a lot of work in resin uh, and it was like a fiberglass resin and I'm trying to move away from the super toxic aspect of that and I came across um, making this combination that I love to use now and basically everything that's plaster mixed with paper clay and there's like an adhesive in the paper clay that like will stick to literally anything so uh, that's how the rocks actually adhere to the piece it's just like in the material and once you get it in there you really can't pull it out um, and then my shirt was a purchase <laughs> from the gem show. Um, and it's just like all of these really, it's the ultimate mineral guide. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and you get one like every year, right? Uh, I, I mean, I, ch I want to, I try to. This year it was like a little, I feel like I, I, I kind of got the best one. <laughs> um, Kara and we have um, Andrew wants to ask a question um, about the apotropaic power that you were talking about earlier so like how do you think um, how do you think of apotropaic power objects and um, these and apotropaic gestures with um, in relationship to the more casual um culture more casual or banal culture around these items like porn or the nudist colony that you spent some time looking at i think like the first thing that comes to mind was i actually think it's pretty spot on when i lived in new york i also have this memory of it being really really late and I was like the only person on a subway platform and the doors opened and there was actually like a full on flasher <laughs> with like a trench coat and he like opened his trench coat and he was like you know completely nude and I was just like so I didn't know whether to like laugh or cry I was just like so taken aback and I feel like that is exactly like the <laughs> aperture <laughs> power that he was using that's still really relevant <laughs> um so I think yeah that's like kind of this that's real <laughs> so you're it's like you're trying to harness the power of both like amazement and repulsion or like kind of like <laughs> out of <laughs> you don't know what to do <laughs> I, I feel like as a follow-up question, I'm also thinking about that, like, how do you think about that in relation to, like, fertility rituals? Um, you know, it's like the, the function of some of these objects as related to the two depictions of, like, um, depictions or omens or something um, uh, for fertility and also sensuality. Like, how do those things relate to each other? Um, I think there were, I was, this is a long time ago, so my memory is also not so good, but I was <laughs> reading in this section and it was in a temple um, somewhere in India where there, at the entrance, there was a statue of um, basically this vulva and before, and it was a fertility temple. So people would walk in and they would actually like lick their hands and then rub the sculpture. Um, 
So I think that's actually like a really, really powerful gesture and a really powerful image that comes to mind when it comes to um, kind of like this worship of these items. And I think there is there is power in in worship and in and belief systems. Cool. Wait, so how does that relate to the nudists? Like <laughs> how do the sculptures, like how does how do the Sheila gigs relate to the nudists? <laughs> because of their attitude? Or is it <laughs> An attitude towards life. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> um, Kara, can I ask you a little bit about like also in your work? I think there's a lot of like something about the absorption of energy that you were talking about. Like that in a way, like all these crystals, like they have like energies, right? Like that's why a lot of people buy them or they have like these like functions. Um, yeah. And do you like think about that when you make a piece? Um, I don't know if I necessarily believe in that when I'm making a piece, but I kind of do believe in it because <laughs> when I go to the gem shows like if you're inside one of those stadiums you could really only be like the maximum amount of time that i could be inside one of those places is like two hours before i start like feeling in so like so insanely crazy and i feel like it does have a lot to do with <laughs> the energy <laughs> in the room so, or like yeah it's it's kind of wild so it's not necessarily that I'm like, oh, this crystal is supposed to mean this, and this is why I'm putting it in the piece. Um, but they just are kind of um, objects that I like to have around to energize me. <laughs> well, also, there are things that come, they're very, in, they're different to art in that they they are made by the earth, right? But yeah. there are these objects that exist and are made through like like hundreds of years of minerals and chemicals yeah. coming together and then they become this object. Right. Um, it's like kind of really astounding. When we visited the cave, they were talking about the stalactites and how it took something like 10,000 years for the stalactite to grow like a half an inch or something like that just like they're just really really crazy amazing powerful things <laughs> um do we have any more questions gabby we don't for now so i was gonna say this that seems like a really good note to like end the formal part of our time here and I'm now officially letting everyone um, unmute themselves so please stay and hang for a little while um, and you know chat but thank you so much Kara this is amazing it's so great to talk about your work <laughs> um, in the meantime how's everyone doing <laughs> It's so nice to see so many familiar faces out there. Hi, Kara. Hi, Helena. <laughs> Glad you came. So lovely to hear you talk about your work. <laughs> Agreed. Thanks so much, Kara and everyone, for organizing this. When's the next talk? Every, well, we don't, I, there's a question as to whether we're going to keep Thursdays, but we do one a week during quarantine. And if you send me your info over the chat, I will put you on our mailing list. Cool. Yeah, there has been this issue where at the beginning, no one was doing Zoom talks. And now there's multiple Zoom talks happening on Thursday at the same time all like conversations with artists so we're wondering if we should choose a less like crowded day but if y'all are here then maybe we don't need to <laughs> but we'll see
I have a question. I, you know, anybody who's written a subway in New York knows about your experience with the trench coat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you, I mean, I'm old now, so I just laugh when it happens, but I worry about the young women. In any case, that, that just kills it. But do, do, have you represented that kind of two-way feeling? Are you afraid? Are you angry? Do you think it's hilarious? I think, I think it's complicated. I think that at first I'm horrified, like at first I was horrified and I was really scared. And then when the threat was over and the doors closed, I just like broke out into like this deep belly laughter. So, <laughs> so it's kind of just like this, this it's just like this push and pull of emotions. Thank you. I have to go bang my pot. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Cara. I can mute her, though. That's really great. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> <sighs> no, it's, it's still there. <laughs> hmm? Um, who else is here? Are people banging pots in LA? In, I think they are in, not in Topanga, they're not. Yeah, no, that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> no one would hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard rumors that in other places in LA, they are. Mm. Like, right next to the hospital or something? I think in, like, Echo Park and Silver Lake and places like that. It's a pretty uh, popular nightly activity. Mm. Yeah, I've never heard a pot in my neighborhood, except like the one of the first nights my housemates and I like clapped and someone on a bike definitely thought that we were clapping for them. Like, <laughs> unrelatedly. Like, just, they're like, cool. <laughs> like, they're so confused. Um, my, my landlord, he was the only one downstairs banging pots. And now there's like a couple people, but people are like, hooting and hollering which that just does that doesn't feel right to me when people are like yeah I'm like that Kelly why not but, I don't know it just feels like the wrong sort of way I don't know it just feels weird to me um but. the celebration of life yeah but people will be free to yell that's true I'm not I'm not yelling at them to be quiet <laughs> <laughs> um how are all of y'all doing um, Karen, <laughs> I'm gonna put you on the spot. Unmute yourself. Oh, I just, oh yeah, I, d I didn't know I was muted. Uh, <laughs> good. I'm about to eat fried chicken. So. Is, Is it, it from Popeyes? Here? What? Did you get it at Popeyes? Yeah, we still, we got like the 20 piece meal. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> we can stretch it during the week. <laughs> She's eating for two. Yeah. <laughs> After the initial during the week. Yeah. But thanks, Kara. I learned so much about your work. I loved it. Thank you for coming, Karen. <laughs> yeah. Just like, bye, I'm gonna go eat. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, George? Well, you know, this week was my first week back to work. Oh, wow. You already went back to work? Yeah. How's that? Where, what are you, where are you going? I work in a, uh, a cabinet shop. Um, they're getting ready the for, like, um, the, like, next week construction like sites open, right? Yep, in New York. Construction sites are back open, so... Really? Yeah, I'm getting a leg up on the shit that has to be installed. In the city or just or upstate? No, in the city. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's open construction, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. So, so the net is opening in August. I'm exhausted. I'm not used to it. You know? Oh. <laughs> really? The Met is opening in August? Mid-August, if not later. No. Really? Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah, today they published it. They're like, they're not opening before mid-August, maybe a couple weeks later, and they canceled all talks and events through 2020. Oh my god, is yeah, it on the website? Yeah, Hyperallergic published it today. Okay, I just looked this morning, and I couldn't, and I was like, I was like, when is the Met reopening? <laughs> it's like, we all need, like, I'll be there. <laughs> like, you didn't have it on there, I didn't see it yet. Caroline, what are you making? Um, uh, I'm making, a. Uh, I wrote it down. I don't know if I'm saying it right. right. A brown marmorated stink bug. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Can we see it? Yeah, it's not done yet. I don't have it. It is part of it. Oh, wow. Cool. I don't know. It looks weird. I never showed anyone anything I do. Yours first. <laughs> I loved wearing, I loved wearing, or not wearing, I mean, I loved hearing about um, your talk, Kara. Oh. Everything, your work is so awesome. It was like incredible. Thank you. Kara, do you feel like? Now that you did this, that you're gonna like do talks all over the place. <laughs> this was actually kind of like my first talk. I was really nervous. <laughs> well, I was walking awesome. down the stairs to this room and like my knees were shaking. <laughs> 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 you didn't sound nervous at all. Yeah, very pro. Yeah. 